Welcome back to Introduction to Logic, Module 9, Categorical Logic. In the last module, as we were looking at fallacies, we were introduced to Charles Dodgson, better known as Lewis Carroll, and we played his game of logic, which served well as an introduction to categorical thinking. So it will be helpful in this module to keep in mind how he helped us in the last module to think about propositions such as all new cakes are nice cakes. But whereas Dodgson was writing in the 1800s, this week we are going way back to 4th century BC and Aristotle's approach to categorical logic. So our primary emphasis is on the traditional approach to categorical logic, but we will also consider some of the differences between Aristotle's approach and Boole's approach in the 1800s. As with other modules, I am pulling heavily from the work of philosopher James Fieser. Much of the information in this module, including some direct wording and many of the examples, come directly from the openly accessible material that Fieser made available online for his own logic course. So let's begin. By now we understand what propositions are. When we approach categorical logic, we are putting our propositions into four categories. So there are four standard forms of categorical propositions. And the identifiers for these forms are taken from two Latin words. One word is related to affirmation. Both of these sorts of propositions are affirming something. And so we identify them as either A propositions or I propositions. A propositions come in the form all S is P. For example, all students are people. I statements come in the form some S is P. Some students are pilots. We also have propositions that state something of negation. So pulling vowels from the Latin word for negation, we call these E propositions or O propositions. An E proposition comes in the form no S is P. For example, no students are pelicans. And an O proposition comes in the form some S is not P. For example, some students are not partiers. Now there are four requirements for a categorical proposition. Each of these forms must contain one quantifier, all, no, or some, a subject, this is the S term, a copula, is, are, or is not, and a predicate, which we call P. So we might say all S are P, no S is P, some S is P, or some S is not P. Now, although Aristotle used what is called the square of opposition, which we will look at soon enough, John Venn created a helpful tool in 1880 for thinking about categories. So we can visualize these categorical forms using Venn diagrams. Now, here's how we go about constructing a Venn diagram. We have a circle for S, the subject, and we have a circle for P, the predicate. We shade the areas where nothing is contained in a set. With all S is P, for example, everything in the S circle is also in the P circle. Everything that we have in this case is both an S and a P. So we shade any S that is not part of P in order to show that no S exists there. In the case of no S is P, nothing in S is also in P. So here we shade the portion of S that overlaps with P. With our statements that come in the form of some S is or is not P, we place an X in the areas where something is contained. This is because when I make a claim about some S, I am not making a claim about all S, and so I do not have enough information to say anything about what every other S is or is not. All I can say is that some 
s. That is, at least one s is or is not p. And so we are noting with an x either that something exists where s and p are both the case, or something exists where s is the case, but p is not. So we've made two distinctions then, one between quality and one between quantity. The statement of quality is a statement that is either affirmative or negative. And the statement of quantity is a statement about a thing, a particular thing, or all things. And to say no thing is to speak of all things. So our A and I propositions are affirmative. All S are, or some S is. While our E and O statements are negative. No S are, or some S are not. And our A and E statements are both universal, speaking of all S or no S, while our I and O statements are particular, speaking of some S. And so, as you can see, each of these four forms has a unique combination of quality and quantity. And these four combinations exhaust all possibilities. The A proposition, all S is P, is affirmative and universal. The E statement, no S is P, is negative and universal. Our I proposition, some S is P, is affirmative and particular. And the O statement, some S is not P, is negative and particular. Now, of course, it's helpful when the propositions come to us in this form, but that's not always the case in ordinary language. So sometimes we have to translate the ordinary language into a categorical form. First, if we have a unit class that is a class with a single member, such as Socrates, it will be helpful to place an asterisk around the unit class. For example, when we speak of all Socrates are men. Next, recall Lewis Carroll's game of logic. He said that there is an understanding between us. For a pig can't be pink. When we say the pig is pink, we're speaking of being when we use the word is. And pigness is not pinkness. And so he pointed out that there is an understanding between us. When we say a pig is pink, or all pigs are pink, what we understand ourselves to be saying is that all pigs are pink pigs. So we understand something to be implied at the end. Therefore, when we're translating the ordinary language into a propositional form for categorical logic, the S and P terms must be nouns. So it might be helpful to add thing after the adjective, and we may even need to rephrase. So the proposition, some apples are red, really means some apples are red things. Or to say all that glitters is gold really means something like all things that glitter are things that are gold. And we may not always be speaking of things, so sometimes we may need to use a different sort of noun. For example, the statement sometimes I am happy would translate into sometimes are times when I am happy. Now we also have to consider the distribution of our terms, and this can be a little tricky at first. Distribution means that what is said about S or P applies to all S or P. In each of our four forms, each term is either distributed or undistributed. When we say all S is P, we are speaking of all S, and yet we've said nothing of all P. For example, all humans are mammals. We have spoken of all humans, but said nothing of all mammals. And so in our A proposition, S is distributed while P is undistributed. In the proposition, no S is P, for example, no human is a reptile, we have distributed both S and P. This one is a little more difficult to see at first, perhaps. To say no S is P 
is the same thing as saying no P is S, which is also the same as saying all S are not P and all P are not S. In the I proposition, some S is P, for example, some humans are female, both terms are undistributed because we have said that some, not all, S is P. And yet, while we know there is something that is P that is also S, this still leaves open the possibility that some P might not be S. And so we've said nothing universal about either term. I think the trickiest form when it comes to understanding distribution is the O form. Some S is not P. For example, some humans are not female. Here we're saying some particular humans do not include females. So it is easy to see why S is undistributed in this case. What is more difficult for some is to understand why not P is distributed. And this is because what we're saying is that the entire class of females does not include all categories of humans. To say it another way, some class of human is excluded from the class all females. So our A statements distribute the subject alone, E statements distribute both subject and predicate, I statements distribute neither term, and O statements distribute the predicate. So to review what we've said so far, we have four forms of a statement, A, E, I, or O. We have two terms with which we are dealing, the subject and the predicate. There is a qualitative aspect of a proposition as it says something either affirmative or negative. And there is a quantitative aspect of a proposition as it says something that is either universal or about a particular thing. And our terms are either distributed or undistributed. And distribution means that what is said about S or P applies to all of S or P. The next term we need to consider is called existential import. Existential, of course, means that something is relating to existence. So what is in question when we assert a proposition, some S or all S or no S, is the existence of the thing of which we speak. There are things about which we can speak that may not exist, but sometimes our language assumes the existence of something. So existential import has to do with whether or not the thing exists. And we can safely say that an S term is committed to existence in the I and the O form of our categorical propositions. Now, philosophers differ on whether universal statements commit one to existence. Namely, Aristotle of the traditional approach to categorical logic and George Boole of the algebraic turn in the 1800s have different perspectives when it comes to whether or not a universal statement commits you to the existence of the thing about which you speak. Yet they are both in agreement that to speak of some indeed assumes the existence of at least one thing. So Aristotle granted existential import not only to I and O forms, the some statements, but also to A and E statements. To say all S are P is to understand, he believes, that some S are P also. Mathematician and philosopher George Boole however, writing in the 1800s, took issue with this. And this, by the way, is one of the issues Lewis Carroll was pressing into in his game of logic. For George Boole, if the class of all things we are considering does not actually exist, then how could it be that some of its members do? For example, we can say that all vampires are undead things. But does this commit us to the idea that some vampires exist? To solve this problem, modern logic translated A and E statements into conditional statements. 
whereas pre-modern logic understood A and E statements to be speaking of existing things, modern logic qualifies A and E statements as conditional. So we can understand all vampires are undead things to mean if there exists such a thing as a vampire, it is an undead thing. Because of the need for this distinction, or as we saw with Lewis Carroll's The Game of Logic, because philosophers at the time were starting to bump up against some of the limitations of the language of the traditional logical system, and so there was a need to expand the vocabulary, the Boolean interpretation came to replace the Aristotelian interpretation as we moved into the modern period of logic. So we can now say that all unicorns have horns without really being committed to the existence or even the non-existence of unicorns. Rather, when we say all unicorns have horns, we are in agreement that if there are or were such things as unicorns, they will or would have horns. And so Boolean notation looks a little different than Aristotelian notation. For Boole, what we should say of an A statement is that wherever there is a class that is S and not P, there are no existing members in that class. So we write this as S not P equals zero. And with an E statement, what we are really saying is that wherever there is a class of S and P, there are no existing members in that class. So we would write this as SP equals zero. Notice how Boole's interest is the existential import, whether or not any existing members are in that class. And so his notation emphasizes this with whether or not the class is equal to zero members or not. So with an I proposition, there is at least one member in the class of S and P. So the way he represents this is the class S and P is not equal to zero. And in the case of an O statement, there is at least one member in the class of S and non-P, so the class S not P is not equal to zero. Since we now understand how Venn diagrams work when using a traditional approach to categorical logic, we can contrast that visually with a Boolean approach. So with all S are P, we would shade everywhere that is an S that is not a P. Now for Aristotle, all S are P implies that some S are P. So an Aristotelian approach would proceed to put an X where S and P overlap. For Boole, on the other hand, we should be cautious speaking of what is. It is safer to speak of what we can know in regards to what is not. In the case of all S are P, we can shade in everywhere that is an S that is not a P. And we can say that we know that in that class where S is not P, nothing exists. This is all we can say. There is no implication. The Boolean and Aristotelian approaches would agree, however, that when we say some S are P, we are indeed speaking of some existing thing. And so we can put an S in the class that is S and P. But Boolean notation would stress that what we are concluding is that in the class SP, it is not the case that nothing exists. When it comes to the universal statement, no SRP, again, the Boolean and Aristotelian traditions differ. Aristotle would be comfortable shading in where S and P overlap. And then because no SRP, implies that some S are not P, the Aristotelian approach would be comfortable placing an X in the class of S and not P, which signifies that something exists there. The Boolean approach would not do this, and Boolean notation SP equals zero clarifies that all we can really say is that in the class of S and P, nothing exists. We must be cautious in what we say beyond this. The Boolean approach agrees that when we are speaking of some S are not P, in this case, we can say that something exists in the class that is S and not P.
It is not the case that nothing exists, and so we may say S not P is not equal to zero. Having a general understanding then of how the Boolean approach is more concerned with the existential import and how it differs therefore from the Aristotelian approach, let us turn now to look more closely at Aristotelian logic. So here we are interested in the immediate inferences that we can make or the inferences that can be made from a single proposition and to what extent differing propositions might be equivalent or not equivalent to one another. When considering the equivalence, there are three terms and approaches you need to know. Conversion, obversion, and contrapositive. With conversion, we simply switch the subject and predicate terms. We saw this, if you recall, in the game of logic. At first, we focused on the x-axis of that game, taking new cakes as our subject, and we had the proposition, all new cakes are nice cakes. But then we focused on the y-axis, taking nice cakes as our subject, and we had a new proposition. All nice cakes are new cakes. So too here, with conversion, we are simply switching the predicate and subject. So our A form, all S are P, becomes all P are S. In the E form, no S are P, becomes no P are S. Likewise, some S are P becomes some P are S, and some s are not p becomes some p are not s. Now once we convert these propositions, we find that in the case of a forms and o forms, the conversions are not equivalent. If we were to draw out the Venn diagrams, they would have different Venn diagrams. For example, with an a form, all students are people is not the same as saying all people are students. And with the O form, to say some students are not partiers is not the same as saying some partiers are not students. So these forms are not equivalent. E and I forms, on the other hand, do seem to be equivalent. That is, if we were to draw the Venn diagrams, they would look the same. In our world of nonfiction, if it's true that no students are pelicans, it's also true that no pelicans are students. And with the I form, if it's true that some students are pilots, then it is also true that some pilots are students. So in summary, with conversion, the A and O forms are not equivalent, while the E and I forms are equivalent. Next we have obversion. Now here we have two steps. First, we need to make sure that we change the quality. If we were speaking of all S, we are now speaking of no S. If we are speaking of no S, we are now speaking of all S. If we were speaking of what some S are, then we will now be speaking of what some S are not, and vice versa. Our second step will be to replace the predicate with its complement. So P will become non-P. So our A form, all S are P, becomes no S are non-P. The E form, no S are P, becomes all S are non-P. The I form, some S are P, becomes some S are not non-P. And the O form, some S are not P, becomes some S are non-P. Now let's consider the examples. All students are people is the same as saying no students are non-people. To say no students are pelicans is the same as saying all students are non-pelicans. The statement some students are pilots communicates the same thing as saying some pilots are not non-students. And finally, to say some students are not partiers is the same as saying some students are non partiers And so we see that when it comes to obversion, all of our forms are equivalent. Finally, we have the contrapositive. This also involves two steps. First, we need to switch the subject and the predicate, as we did with conversion. Then, we need to replace both terms with their complements. So all S are P 
becomes all non-P are non-S. No S are P becomes no non-P are non-S. Some S are P becomes some non-P are non-S. And some S are not P becomes some non-P are not non-S. Now recall that with conversion, A and O statements were not equivalent, but E and I statements were equivalent. With the contrapositive, it is just the opposite. A and O forms are equivalent, while E and I are not equivalent. For example, if it is true that all students are people, then it must be true that all non-people are non-students. Similarly, if some students are not partiers, then some non-partiers are not non-students. However, if it is true that no students are pelicans, it is not also true that no non-pelicans are non-students. Alligators, for example, are non-students. And likewise, if it's true that some students are pilots, this does not mean that some non-pilots are non-students. So in summary, with conversion, A and O forms are not equivalent. With contrapositive, they are. With conversion, E and I forms are equivalent. With contrapositive, they are not. And with obversion, all of our forms are equivalent. All right, now we're ready to talk about one of the most famous aspects of Aristotle's logical legacy, the square of opposition. Now you may notice that it looks very similar to something we saw earlier when we were discussing the difference between Aristotelian and Boolean logic. And an astute student and observer you would be. For with that image, we had simply an X with one of our propositional forms at the end of each line. But now we see two horizontal lines above and below the X and two vertical lines to the left and to the right of the X so that we end up with what is called a square but often looks more like a rectangle and we see that our propositional forms actually make each of the four corners of our box. The reason for this visual difference is precisely the difference we were discussing between Aristotelian and Boolean logic. For Aristotle, is comfortable saying that some forms are implied by other forms, and this is what is forming the sides of our square of opposition. Boole was not comfortable with some of the moves that Aristotle was making, so his emphasis was really more on the contradictories, and as we saw, the question of whether we can say for sure that nothing exists in a category, or at least one thing exists there. Now with the square of opposition, you'll see that our universal statements are placed in the top two corners and our particular statements are placed in the bottom two corners. Our affirmative statements are placed on the left side and our statements of negation are placed on the right. Now that we can visualize our forms in this way, we can see some of the relationships between them more clearly. For example, each of our four corners is a contradictory to the, its opposite corner. All S is P is a contradictory statement to some S is not P. Likewise, if some S is P, it cannot be the case that no S is P. So with our contradictory propositions, we can validly infer opposition when either is true or when either is false. And so our four corners form our contradictory relationships. But then Aristotle points out that there are other relationships as well. Between A and E, we have a contrary relationship. In this case, at least one of them must be false. They both cannot be true. However, it is possible for both of them to be false. With our contradictory statements, they cannot both be true and they cannot both be false. But with a contrary statement, they can both be false, but they cannot both be true. If it is the case that all S is P, then it cannot be the case that no S is P. 
If it's not the case that all s is p, and it's not the case that no s is p, this does not mean that some s might be p. So between our contrary propositions, we can validly infer opposition when either is true, but we cannot do this when either is false. Related to this idea is the subcontrary. So now, if we compare the I and the O forms, we have a similar relationship, a contrary relationship. However, it does not function in exactly the same way as the relationship between A and E. In the case of our universal statements, they could not both be true, although they could both be false. In the case of our particular statements, we can see a contrary relationship when one of them is false. And this is because one of them must be true. Now it is possible that both of our particular statements might be true, but they cannot both be false. So if we know that one is false, then we know that the other is true. So we can validly infer that opposition. Finally, we have the subalternate relationships or the subalternations. Here we want to focus on the vertical lines showing us the relationship between the universal and particular propositions. And this is where the perspectives of Aristotle and Boole really butt heads. For Aristotle, the proposition some s is p is a subaltern to or is implied by the proposition all s is p. Similarly, the proposition some s is not p is implied by the statement no s is p. And when it comes to subalternations, it might be helpful to remember that truth flows downward, falsehood flows upward. So for Aristotle, if it's true all s are p, then it's true some s are p. And if it's false that some s are p, then it's false that all s are p. Similarly, if it is true, no s or p, then it is true, some s are not p. And if it's false that some s are not p, then it's false that no s are p. To say it another way, when a universal is true, the particular is true. If the particular is false, the universal is false. So when a or e propositions are true, their related i or o propositions will be true. When i or o is false, then a or e will be false. Now, when the universal is false, the particular is undetermined. If I know that it is not the case that all s is p, this in itself does not give me enough information to determine whether some s is p. And likewise, when I know that a particular is true, this is not enough to determine the universal quality. If I know that some s is p, for example, this s is a p, this in itself cannot give me the universal proposition that all s are p. This is one of the reasons that inductive methodology can never give us absolute certainty. Empirical scientific research, which is by nature observational and can only ever study the particulars, cannot make the leap to a universal. At best, it can build a case for higher or lower degrees of probability, but never universal certainty. Now, the empiricist can build a case for a high degree of probability for thinking that it seems to be the case that all S are P, and then scientists may agree to proceed with that categorical definition uh, or theory that all S are in fact P in order to advance scientific knowledge or technology in light of our understanding or what we think we know. And we'll go more into induction in module 11, but the point here is just to make that connection to something we've already said in earlier modules concerning the difference between deduction and induction in order to make the point here that it's difficult to assert the universal case when all we have is a particular case. However, if the particular case gives us reason to doubt that a particular thing is the case, then logically we may infer that its universal form is also false. So these are the four relationships between our four forms in Aristotle's square of opposition. Now once you have a good understanding of how the propositions work, 
we can start to form our categorical syllogisms. Now a categorical syllogism has three main parts, a major premise, a minor premise, and a conclusion. And the logical form of a syllogism is determined by its mood and its figure. In short, the mood is the type of proposition used, and the figure involves its arrangement of terms. But let's look more closely. We now understand that a proposition can come in one of four forms. We also understand that a syllogism has three parts. This means that each of these parts may be presented in a different AEIO phrasing. This unique phrasing is what is referred to as the mood. In the syllogism, all men are mortal things, all Socrates are men, all Socrates are mortal things. The mood of the syllogism is A, A, A. They all come in the form all S are P. The form of a syllogism, on the other hand, has to do with the order of the subject, the predicate, and the middle terms in each premise. Now we know well what subject and predicate is, and we've encountered the middle term before in the game of logic. But just to remind you, the middle term is the thing that is shared in the two premises prior to the conclusion. All human beings are mortal. Socrates is a human being. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. In the first two premises, there is a term that was repeated, and that term was human being. All human beings are mortal. Socrates is a human being. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. This middle term is essential in helping us connect something from the first premise and the second premise in order to reach the conclusion. So our syllogisms involve some combination of subject and middle term and predicate and middle term in order to give us a conclusion in the form of subject and predicate. And this unique combination can play out in one of four ways, which is referred to as the figure, the first, second, third, or fourth figure. In the first figure, we are presented with a middle term, then a predicate, and then in the second premise, a subject, then the middle term, to give us the conclusion, subject, predicate. In the second figure, we begin with predicate, moving to middle term, then in premise two, we have the subject moving to middle term, to reach the conclusion involving the subject and the predicate. In the third figure, we move from middle term to predicate. Premise two, we move from middle term to subject to reach the conclusion, subject, predicate. And in our fourth figure, we begin with the predicate moving to the middle term. In the second premise, we move from the middle term to the subject to reach the conclusion, subject, predicate. A few things to note. These are considered the rules. S and P are always in the conclusion, and they are always presented in the same order. Subject first, then predicate. Second, note that the predicate and the middle term are always presented in premise one. Similarly, next, notice that the subject and the middle term are always presented in premise two. Now there's actually a pattern here that may help you to visualize in order to remember these four figures. If you were to draw a line in each of these figures, crossing both of the middle terms out, moving from the first premise to the second premise, notice that because of the arrangement of terms, the way the middle terms align, in the first figure you would have a backslash. In the second and third figure, you would have a vertical bar. And in the fourth figure, you would end up with a forward slash. So each is different. The two in the middle have the vertical alignment, and the difference is just whether the middle term comes first or second. You'll notice that in the second figure, both middle terms align, and they align at the end of the proposition. In figure three, they align at the beginning of the proposition. Perhaps this will help. So now we need an example where we speak of mood and figure together. Consider the argument form, all M is P. All S is M, therefore all S is P. Here, our mood is A, A, A. They each come in the form all X is Y. And if you look at the alignment of middle terms, you see that the first premise 
has a middle term at the beginning of the proposition, and the second premise has a middle term toward the end of a proposition, if we were to draw one line through both of those ends, this would give us a backslash. So we know this is a figure one. So the mood is AAA, -A -A, and it is in the form of a figure one arrangement. Now what about the syllogism? All P is M, some S is not M, therefore some S is not P. In this case, our mood comes in the form all X or Y, some X not Y, some X not Y. So our mood is A, O, O. And if we look at the arrangement of terms, if we were to draw a line through the middle terms, we would end up with a vertical line. Now don't be fooled by the fact that the second two propositions are longer than the first because they are using more or longer words. But if you simplify the argument to P dash M, S dash M, S dash P, then the two M's clearly align. So that tells us it's either figure two or figure three, and both of the middle terms fall at the end of each premise. So that tells us that this is figure two. So our mood is AOO, and this is in the form of a figure two arrangement. So now that we understand the basic nature and function of a standard categorical syllogism, let's talk about how to test the validity of these syllogisms. Now, syllogistic arguments can come in a number of forms, well over 200. And there are three different methods for indicating validity or invalidity. First, we have the use of intuitive lists. This was the method that Aristotle used. But later logicians added two additional methods, Venn diagrams, and also by evaluating whether an argument adheres to five basic rules. The Aristotelian approach is to use what we know from a list of valid forms to see, when considering a particular syllogism, whether it intuitively seems valid. Is it like one of these other forms that we know to be valid or not? If so, intuitively then, it would seem the argument is valid. Now, from an Aristotelian perspective, we can get a list of 24 valid forms. But from a Boolean perspective, we need to be careful with nine of these 24 forms, understanding them as conditionally valid rather than absolutely or unconditionally valid. Boole and Aristotle both agree on 15 forms, so we can call these the unconditionally valid forms. Anytime we have a first figure arrangement with the mood AAA, EAE, AII, or EIO, we can know that the argument is valid. Anytime we have a figure two arrangement of AEE, -E, EAE, AOO, or EIO, the argument will be valid. In a figure three arrangement, an unconditionally valid form will carry the mood of AII, IAI, EIO, or OAO. And with figure four, we only get three, A-E-E-I-A-I, -E -E or E-I-O. Aristotle and Boole agree that these forms will always give you a valid argument. They differ, however, on the other nine forms. And so these we call the conditionally valid forms. Recall what we said earlier about Boole's concern for the existential import. If I speak of all vampires, am I committed to the conclusion that there are some vampires? No, we have to be careful and say, if there are vampires, then they will be like this. Although these forms were considered valid by Aristotle, for Boole, they assume that a term in the conclusion exists. But Boole was not comfortable going that far. And so we stressed the need to qualify our conclusion as a conditional. Recall how Lewis Carroll, writing in this time period, was similarly interested in linguistic problems such as saying, I see nobody, or the phrase, no new cakes are nice and none are not nice. Thus, no new cakes exist. So if they exist, the only cakes that can exist are not new cakes. In theory, the logic can work, 
But since it is not really possible for a not new cake to exist, if it is the case that no new cakes can exist, then we can make an argument and something might follow logically. However, we are not actually speaking of an existing thing. And so nothing will follow logically as it relates to existence, but only as it relates to another idea. So these nine forms are qualified valid forms. They're conditional on the condition that there exists such a thing as not new cakes, then we can conclude that not new cakes are the only kind of cakes that exist. So these nine forms do give us valid arguments, but they cannot always guarantee that we are speaking of actually existing things. Nevertheless, the conclusion does follow from the premises. So if we are dealing with a first figure arrangement, if the argument comes in the form AAI or EAO, then we can add this to the list of valid forms. In a figure two arrangement, AEO and EAO forms are also valid. An AAI or EAO mood in a figure three arrangement is also valid. And finally, with figure four, there are three additional valid forms, AEO, EAO, and AAI in mood. So our first method for testing validity would be simply to compare the argument before us with one of these forms. If the argument matches one of these valid forms, then we can say that the argument is valid. Now, if it helps, and if not, as an interesting side note and historical fact, a mnemonic poem was developed in the Middle Ages using Latin, which was the primary language of medieval academia, where each line of the poem contained a series of words. And each of these words in a given line contained a particular combination of vowels. For example, the first line, Barbara Kellarent Darii Ferio, that's actually the classical pronunciation, Kellarent. In the Middle Ages, it would have been Celarent, the ecclesiastical Latin pronunciation. Barbara Celarent Darii Ferio. Rhythmically interesting, but to the point, look at the vowel combination. Barbara, ah, ah, ah. That's A, A, A. For our figure one, that is a valid form. Celarent, A, A, A. That's an E, A, E, another valid form. Darii, A, A, E, E, A, I, I. Ferio, E, E, O, E, I, O, another valid form. So the whole poem is Barbara Celarent, Darii, Ferio. Camestres Cesare Barocco Festino. Datisi disamis ferison bacaro, damines de maris frisison. As with many other poems, amidst the musical flourishing which followed the invention of the printing press, this poem was set to music in the Renaissance by a composer named Jacob Gall. By that time, there were additional versions of this poem which include some additional wording and this song by Jacob Gall seems to focus only on figures one, two, and three, as there is no mention of figure four. The second method of testing validity, and arguably what has become one of the most popular approaches, is to use a Venn diagram. So here, for a syllogism, where we have three premises, we need three overlapping circles, one for S, one for P, and one for M. And then we're going to diagram the first two premises, but not the conclusion, in order to see whether the conclusion reveals itself. If so, the argument is valid. If not, it is invalid. Now, if we do have universal and particular propositions in the mix, it will be important to remember to diagram the universal premise before the particular. So take the argument, all M is P, 
all s is m, therefore all s is p. In this Venn diagram, we have three circles overlapping, s, m, and p. Any part of circle s, which is not inside circle m, has been shaded in. Any part of circle M, which does not lie within circle P, has likewise been shaded in. And this Venn diagram indeed reveals to us that all remaining S lies within P. Now take the example, all P is M. Some S is not M, therefore some S is not P. Once again, we have three overlapping circles, S, M, and P. Any part of circle P, which is not inside circle M, is shaded in. And then we place an X inside the part of the circle S, which does not lie within either circle P or circle M. Next, we place an X in the remaining part of circle S that is not part of circle M. And since all P remaining lie within circle M, we can now see that the X inside of S is clearly outside of area P. So indeed, this argument seems to be valid. Now, sometimes it may be unclear exactly where we should place that X. For example, this was a figure two arrangement of the AOO mood. But what if it had been figure one? All M is P, and so we shade in all of circle M that is not part of circle P. But then we have a remaining space where S and P overlap, and we do not really know what to do with that from the second premise that some S is not M. This does not necessarily mean it is not P. So should the X go clearly in the S circle where there is no P overlapping, or might that X go in the space where S overlaps P but is not part of M? It is unclear. So when the placement of X is ambiguous, we should put it on a line which indicates that the argument will be invalid since it could go in either direction, and so we would not be able to clearly draw the conclusion. The third method is simply to apply five rules of validity. First, we must have at least one premise in which the middle term is distributed. Second, the term is distributed in the conclusion if and only if it is distributed in the premise. Third, we must have at least one premise that is an affirmative premise. And fourth, if our conclusion is negative, then we must have a negative premise. To say it another way, we can have a negative conclusion if and only if we have a negative premise. And finally, our argument cannot conclude a particular given two universals. As long as none of these rules is violated, then we may safely say that the argument seems to be valid. Here's an example. All M is P, some M is not S, Therefore, some s is not p. In this case, rule 1 is okay. The middle term is distributed in premise 1. Rule 3 is okay because premise 1 is affirmative. Rule 4 is satisfied because although the conclusion is negative, we do have one premise that is negative, premise 2. And rule 5 is satisfied because the conclusion is particular, but it does not come from two universal statements. Premise two is a particular premise. Rule two, however, fails because the P term is distributed in the conclusion, but it is not distributed in premise one. The term that is distributed in the conclusion must be distributed in the premise. Still using a figure three arrangement, what about this example using an EAE mood? All M is P, no S is M, therefore no S is P. We have no particulars in any of our premises nor in the conclusion, so rule five doesn't even apply, it's not violated. Rule four is satisfied because premise two is negative and the conclusion is negative. Rule three is satisfied because we do have an affirmative premise, premise one. 
Rule number one is satisfied because the middle term is distributed in premise one. Once again, however, this argument fails to satisfy rule two. For once again, there is a P term distributed in the conclusion, but not in the premise. Now, the last thing we should consider is that not all syllogisms come in a standard form. And so we need to be able to test validity when they come in a non-standard form. There are two particular types that we are looking at. One is called enthymemes, and the other is sorites. An enthymeme is a syllogism with a hidden or unstated premise. We often mean or imply more than we actually say. Take the statement, Socrates is mortal because he is human. The first premise that is necessary for this argument is unstated. All men are mortal things. All Socrates are men. Therefore, all Socrates are mortal things. Here's another example. Candide is a typical French novel, therefore it is vulgar. In this argument, we are once again missing a first premise. In this case, it is the assumption that all French novels are vulgar things. What the author intends to communicate is this. All French novels are vulgar things. All Candide are French novels. Therefore, all Candide are vulgar things. So unfortunately, with ordinary language, we often have to try to figure out what someone is trying to argue in order to fill in the missing premises, in order to then determine whether or not the argument they think they are making is actually a valid one. Finally, we need to consider sorites, because this is also something you may encounter. Relating to the Greek word for heap, as in a pile of stuff, sometimes people try to pile on arguments and things get a little complex because one argument leads directly into another. A sorite is also called a polysyllogism, is when we have a chain of two or more syllogisms where the conclusion of one becomes the premise of the next. Now these can become quite complex, especially if the speaker is careless with logic or with their language. But here's a simpler example. All lions are big cats. All big cats are predators. All predators are carnivores. Therefore, all lions are carnivores. So we need to revise this argument so that we see it in a form that we can work with. And that form needs to clearly show each syllogism embedded within. So the first thing we should do is to look for the enthymeme. Identify what follows from two premises that is meant to give force to the next set of premises. In this case, we begin with all lions are big cats, then all big cats are predators. What is missing is the conclusion that all lions are predators. Note further that this did not come in the form that we've learned here in this lesson to expect. We did not begin with a premise about M and P and then proceed to a premise about S and M. We began with all S are M and then all M are P. And then, of course, did not even state the conclusion implied that all S are P. So we're going to need to revise that in just a moment. But we have another problem, don't we? Now that we've identified the first argument, what remains of the second? All predators are carnivores, therefore all lions are carnivores. Well, that in itself is not a complete argument. Moreover, there is only one term that is shared between this argument and the prior, and that is our P term, predators. So we have some revising to do. The first step in our revision process was to identify the enthymeme. The second step is to then revise the two or more arguments involved, putting them in proper form and making clear any unstated premises. We found what was unstated for the first argument, therefore all lions are predators, but we also have something unstated in the second argument, 
The second argument is arguing that all predators are carnivores and that lions are predators. Therefore, lions are carnivores. So let's revise this polysyllogism into two standard syllogisms. We begin with the argument all big cats are predators. All lions are big cats. Therefore, all lions are predators. Based on that conclusion, we then move to the second argument. All predators are carnivores. All lions are predators. Therefore, all lions are carnivores. And the Venn diagram will work well for testing our polysyllogisms. But there are two methods for using a Venn diagram. First, now that we have separated each argument, we can look at the validity of each argument within the Sorites. So for our first argument, we would have three circles for lions, predators, and big cats. We would shade in to rule out all parts of the big cat circle that are not part of the predator circle. And then we would shade in all parts of the lion class that are not part of the big cat category. This shows us that all lions are predators. And then we move on to the second Venn diagram. Three circles, one for lion, one for predator, and one for carnivores. We shade in all parts of the predator circle that is not part of the carnivores circle. And then we shade in all parts of the lion circle that is not part of the predator circle. And this proves that the conclusion, all lions are carnivores, is indeed a valid conclusion. But there is another method, as there are ways to make a Venn diagram account for more than just three categories. In this case, we could use a four-term Venn diagram. Here we would need four ovals overlapping, two leaning diagonally to the left and two leaning diagonally to the right. The two ovals leaning to the left are labeled lions and big cats, while the two leaning to the right are labeled predators and carnivores. First, let's take the proposition all lions are big cats. So we need to remove all portions of lions outside of big cats. Next, take all big cats are predators and remove all portions of big cats outside of predators. Our third proposition says all predators are carnivores and so we remove all predators outside the carnivore area. And the conclusion is that all lions are carnivores and indeed all that remains of our lion category lies within the category of carnivores. There are a number of ways that Venn diagrams can be made Here's a seven set Venn diagram, and here's an eight set Venn diagram. So Venn diagrams can be quite useful, and you can also have a bit of fun with them as well. This concludes module nine and our study in categorical logic. Until next time, think well, ponder long, and have fun doing it.